So this is a, a guy called John England, England's first folk singer. Perfect name for him. Um, it's a very romantic story how it all came about. There's this guy, a gardener in the rectory in Hambridge in Somerset. And uh, he, he was out gardening as he was and Cecil Sharp was sitting inside the vicarage window taking tea with the vicar. And uh, the, the sounds of the seeds of love, a very quintessential English folk song, floated in through the window and caught Sharp's ear. And from that moment he discovered this world of folk song and decided to investigate and explore and captured this real snapshot of, of a real movement that had been going on in England. So we have this man to thank for it. Um, so who was he? What was he all about? And, and why don't we still sing as we're going about our work like John England was? How many people here are folk singers? We've done a bit of hands up. Folk singer, good man, sir. Anybody else? No, that doesn't surprise me. That's all right, don't worry. Who sings at church or at football matches? A few more. OK, who sings at kids' birthday parties? Who knows happy birthday? <laughs> Okay, we are a singing culture. We are a community of singers. We have been much more so in the past. In the 50s and 60s, there were lots of pubs singing around the pianos. And then before that, pre-industrial area, there was a lot of singing in pubs, a lot of fairs and social gatherings, singing at family celebrations as well. It was a real part of communities and local music making. Industrialization really changed all that and uh, really took away... Uh, a culture, a community of living, a, a way of uh, earning money, a way of uh, commercial avenues, but also a way of recreational spending time and communicating with each other. And at that time, uh, there was a big movement around the whole of Europe to try and look back and reflect on that period, probably quite romanticised looking at this, this lost peasantry, who were this rural dream that was going on. And the Germans, they coined this term Volks, Volksleder uh, for folk song, that there was this practice, this thing that existed and that was getting lost and, and taken away. So throughout Europe and here in England as well, there was a big push for people like Sharp to go out and record these things before they were lost. And a lot of the work of those early collectors has just recently been put online by the English Folk Dance and Song Society uh, on this phenomenal web-based portal. It's a digital portal uh, and it's freely accessible for everybody to access all the, the materials that these collectors were working on. There's over 58,000 scans in here, so there's no, no reason for you not to all become folk singers. You can learn these songs. They're all there. So the motivations for these collectors for going about this work were very different. We've got people like Ralph Vaughan Williams here. Many of you have probably heard of him and his classical music compositions. Again, throughout Europe, they wanted to differentiate between the different cultures. This Western classical music wasn't good enough anymore. They wanted English music, Hungarian music, Bartok was doing the same, German music, French music. And so for people to give them their national flavour, they were going back to their, their roots, their folk music. That's where they were looking. So that was a big push. There was also others like Lucy Broadwood. Where's Lucy? At the top, yes, there she is, reclining, bless her, there, um, laid out on her sofa, reading a book. We have Broadwood and Frank Kidston as well, who uh, is this fella here, looking rather stern. And they were very interested in uh, more academicising it, turning it into a systematic approach of recording and documenting what was happening for the future. And then people like Cecil Sharp and his assistant, Maud Carpleys, they were very keen to push it into the education system to develop a schools programme. The older among you might remember learning folk songs at schools in a very painful way. Um, but, so he was responsible for that, go sharp. But it did teach the nation um, this cultural heritage. He wanted us to be able to identify with Englishness and where we culturally came from, because that was very much getting lost. So working with this archive has been incredible. Learning a bit more about these people is great. And something that really made them human for me was this film which turned up, which is absolutely beautiful. And I'll show you a little bit of it now. It shows Cecil Sharp and Maud Carpley's, Carpley's sister, Helen, and also George Butterworth, who's up there at the top with his little moustache. Um, Movember, clearly, running a long time. Um, and he, he was interested in Morris dancing, and so he was collecting the dances of people around. And he got very good at it. He was a, he was a very practiced dancer. Sharp, on the other hand, although his heart was in the right place, his feet perhaps sometimes weren't. So. Uh...
So lovely. Really brings out the human in them, I think, there. So what else is in the... Uh, Barry Canlon, good Sheffield man there. Um, what else? What's in the archive there? Not there. It's, uh, it's unfortunately not the video and the audio. It's the, the written manuscripts, the, the, um, the scrapbooks, the, the, the documents that these people produce. So Frank Kidson, as I mentioned, he was very interested in collecting these broadside sheets. So these were very cheaply printed penny sheets with uh, either depictions of local stories on, there's, uh, there's disasters, local disasters or disasters at sea, uh, battles, we've got something here on Napoleon, historical retellings of stories, romantic stories, and a, a bit of smut as well in there. There can be a bit of jolly story too. So these were very widely spread, bought up cheaply and just sold out there. There's also the handwritten notes down. This is uh, from Lucy Broadwood's hand, and she's just written out the lyrics as a singer is performing to her. So this is as she was written at the time, or, or sometimes people sent them to them and they would write them down afterwards. So this is uh, from the, uh, the singing of John Searle here, a song called The Servant Man. So it's this raw data, the, 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 the pen on the paper that's in there. There's also tune transcriptions and tune notations and dance notations too, so little figures of where people move around. And often these were done in the field, out in communities where the collectors were going to visit this rural peasantry that they were trying to tap into. This is a, a score which was written, well, score is a bit of a grand word for it, a notation of a performance by a great singer, Joseph Taylor, by Percy Granger, an Australian uh, collector and composer. And it really shows, if you can see with the lights, that there's, there's two lines at the top there, and it's two versions. The singer's singing it twice. And so he's written the tune out. And then the second time, where he sings it differently, he's got little bits of variation going on. And the symbols here and there where the singer pauses or stretches time and it really the whole the whole archive has got examples of scribblings out little crossings out little question marks bits of ambiguity but uncertainty it's a long way away from the published things that you get you know your, your book of folk songs where these are the words that's the tune go and sing it that's not what folk music's about there's hundreds of versions of the same song can crop up in different parts of the country, different parts of Europe. Um, and it's this sort of the flexibility, the fluidity of the music which really shines through. Um, now, to celebrate the launch of this fabulous archive, uh, they commissioned me to put together a band. And um, here we are in rehearsal. This is me. And uh, I asked these six musicians to join me because um, they wanted me to go into the archive and, and dig around and show people what was in there. And I was keen to give a lot of different perspectives on it. So it wasn't just my voice, really. So I got lots of different people who approach folk and traditional music differently. They're all renowned musicians in their own right. We've got Seth Lakeman up here, um, a Mercury Award Prize nominee and a very, very popular folk musician. And he was really interested in the broadsides and taking the big dramatic stories and, uh, and turning them, writing choruses, writing new music for them and turning them into very contemporary songs. Nancy Kerr up here on the fiddle, she took it one step further and wrote her own material in response to the collectors and this idea of a bygone age. So really writing new stuff. And Martin Simpson over here with the guitar, Sheffield man, he... Um, he, instead of looking at the material so much, he got really obsessed with a particular singer and from where he's from in Lincolnshire and looking at this guy called Joseph Taylor. Here he is, a, a farm bailiff from Lincolnshire who entered a singing competition uh, to get some of these folk songs out. And uh, he is the, one of the, well, he is the first recorded folk singer. So in 1906, Percy Granger went and recorded this singing competition, and we hear Taylor's voice coming out singing some of this very old stuff. Um, so Martin got really obsessed with him and, and the, the musicality of his singing. So we took Taylor's singing and, and recording, and then we've improvised music over it. So to just give you a little flavour of the, the project that we did, I'll just play you a little snip of that. It was on the 5th of August, the weather of unfair and to prepare, I did to repair the love I was inclined. I got up with the lad in the morning, it was really hard to go to see, expect to see, to see, to see, to see, to see, to see. 
Okay, now I really must emphasize that this is not about getting to some essential Englishness, about getting to the purity of our tradition and, and where we're all about, with ex exclusion of all external influences. It's about a snapshot of a patchwork of very different lived experiences and perspectives on life, a real celebration of our nation's diversity. Commonalities do surface, though, and the archive throws out lots of songs relating to the universals of love and death and drinking, essentially. And it's a real explosion of people exploring those and positioning themselves around them. Um, you've got songs of really difficult moral issues, so it's, uh, there's infanticide in there, um, cuckoldry. There's a lovely song, um, we were talking about lawyers earlier, and who hates the lawyers? But this is a song from, there's no date on this, but around that same time, early 1900s, about how the lawyers will gobble the lot. Yeah. People are really exploring those really deeper issues in life. So you have to align yourself with songwriting. The performances are received as well, and moving beyond individuals' perception of where they sit with those ideas of, of the bigger issues in life. They serve to construct a sort of social morality and a social boundary in the community as to where your, your opinions on these ma massive matters lie. Now we can sing to share experiences of ourselves um, and uh, align ourselves with things or align ourselves away from things, sing of atrocities, but it all creates this sense of connection with the world. We don't have many songs in common anymore, and I'm really hard pushed to find examples of things people are familiar with. I was going to get you all to sing Happy Birthday in the very different rude versions of Squash Tomatoes, but I'm clearly going to run out of time, so I won't do that um, or embarrass you. But that's the idea that well, how do you get in there? How many, how many different ways can you sing songs? How will you retell a song yourself in different ways? And, and, and how rude can you be back to me in this environment here? But we don't have songs like that that we can do this with anymore, and we don't have places to go and sing so much. Um, there is a big network of folk clubs, but that is attended by such a narrow section of society that it's, it's become a real specialist art form. Uh, beards are, are back, you know. <laughs> It'd be brilliant if the folk music, if every man who had a beard was also a folk singer like it used to be. That would do me well. And in contemporary English society, music is created by the few and consumed by the masses, very X-Factor style. So celebrities are voted out and only the chosen few get to go on and make music. Similarly, in schools, it's all about training people up to be the professional musicians. And now Education Secretary Nicky Morgan is now suggesting that this even distracts from core subjects and limits career choices. So... People use the arts, though, to make sense of the world around them and themselves within it. And it strikes me that this life skill is really lacking in contemporary society, leading to a real disconnection between individuals and civic society. Rather than removing opportunities to develop individuals' creative capacity, the arts should be mobilised to embrace it. Through exploring the great questions of life, the sociological imagination is awakened. And as individuals perceive themselves and their life struggles as part of a larger whole, then this connected structure of living in this world can happen. Issues of daily life can be understood in broader terms, and that helps empower people to address issues of change in their own, in their own environments. In the full English, we've got a massive resource which could be utilised to explore the past and reflect on the present. It's not about singing a whole class of kids to sing Hey Nonny No, you know, that's getting away from those times. But singing together can be incredibly therapeutic, so I'm not dismissing that either. But it's about moving a step beyond that, using this as a way of reflecting, looking at the communities they came from, using the structures and ideas to build new songs and build new communities, contemplating our position in the world and telling it through these magical stories. The important element is active participation, not passively receiving the, arti the artistic vision of the few, but creating a societal reflection of the many, like we've got in the full English here. Although our album was a huge success, and uh, we won folk awards, had my splash with media, very exciting, um, John Bowden made a very important point at the recent Folk Music Expo aimed at industry people. He was saying that uh, society would probably be fine if we lost folk music as a genre, if, if we didn't have folk on two on the radio, we didn't have the folk show, we didn't have all this, something else would step up, we'd have a jazz show instead. It'd be okay, you'd all be all right if I didn't have my job doing this, that would be okay. But if as a culture we lose the ability to connect with each other, 
to, to perform and to make social music together, then we really are in dire straits. I think that's a very important element of the world. And uh, it's, it's something that we, we absolutely need to keep connecting with. While if ever you wish for to smile or hear a true story of old, a tent of a tried out fall, the valorous fame did resound through every village and town. Fun for frolic and whim, none ever was equal to him. So that's us. We should all be folk singers, in my humble opinion. And uh, this archive, both as raw materials and as a snapshot of a communal expressive art form, should be mobilised and used creatively to confront the issues of our fragmented society head on. Thank <laughs> you.